Hello, yes, that's right, it's Joe here. Yes, that's right, it's Joe here, live for Joyrider TV for some more Q&A. Sorry, I forgot about this microphone. Um, but hello, yes, we are back for some more Q&A. Uh, thanks for coming already. It looks like Finn and Willis are having a good old chat in the chat already. Hello also to Smoking Stang. Great to have you on board already. Um, yes, yeah, so what's going down? Yeah, we're going to have some Q and A where you're asking the questions and I'm hopefully going to be coming up with some sort of answers. Um, yeah, that's about the size of it. So um, we'll just see what Finn and Willis have been talking about. It's 2.30 in the morning where Finn is. Uh, I think he's in Adelaide. Australia, and uh, Finn's talking about buying a Dragoon. Now, um, for everybody in the States, I'm not sure how, how uh, well known the Hobie Dragoon is, but um, it's basically Hobie's kind of perform more performance and 13-foot boat. Um, it came out in, hold on, I've got to think about this. I think it first came out in the year 2001 as a replacement for the Hobie 13. The Hobie 13 was like a cross between, um, no, it wasn't, was it? Yeah, it was kind of like a cross between a Hobie 18 and a Hobie 14, if there could ever be such a thing. It kind of bolted together like an 18, um, but then it had the asymmetric holes, perhaps a bit more like a Prindle 15. Uh, great fun to sail in the waves. I had a lot of fun sailing the Hobie 13s back in the day, uh, but the Hobie Dragoon's definitely the step in the right direction. Um all right, um, Finn says he's in Melbourne, not Adelaide. Okay, beg your pardon there, Finn. Um, I don't know why I got that into my head. But um, yeah, so the Dragoon uh, came about at the same time as the Hobie Pacific, uh, first designed by Hobie Cat Europe. And um, it was no surprise when it was designed at the same time as the Pacific, had a very similar hull shape with uh, quite a thick bow and a skeg hull. So um, very manageable. And it was designed as a youth boat. So kind of like for the first boat that young sailors would go into as a team. The Dragoon then evolved. Uh, it first came out, um, the standard one was just with a main and a jib. And then the spinnaker was available. But of late, the well, in the last 10 years or so, the Dragoon then got upgraded to make it basically like a small Formula A team without dagger boards, where it's got a self-tacking jib, a spinnaker with a chute, and um, it's double trapeze. So put two, like, um, two young people on board, like perhaps total weight about 80 kilos or something and the dragoon is like a scaled down f18 great to see we have featured some on show us your cat with the right size of sailor but of course like a lot of children or youth boats we should call them um they do work very well as a single hander for bigger people when it's really windy um, you may have seen a video on Joyrider TV of a now in a lot of wind, which ends up in quite a spectacular crash. Oh, yes. Yes. So hello to everybody who's just tuning in. Great to have you all here with us. Let's just check in with everybody who's checking in. Um, all right. As well as Willis. Then we've got Smoking Stang there. We've got Ollie Smith, who's over in Canada. He's enjoying some powder, I believe. I uh, hope you're having a great time there, Ollie. Uh, we've got John Claude in Trinidad. 
great to have you with us as always. Toot has joined us in Texas. Thank you for coming, Toot. Um, all right. Uh, Willis says, do you have any more fitage, footage of ditching at 25 knots? Great stuff. My dad taught me that you want to land on the sail or the water, not the boom. Absolutely. I would definitely... Sorry, I've got something going on here. Um, I would definitely go along with that. So let's make this a first question. Where should you land when you capsize? This is a great question. There's two seats um, on the boat. Let's just have a boat. Which happens to be a very dragoon shaped hull actually. Um, and then we'd have a back beam, front beam, maybe the back beam would be more like here. Um, then we've got a mast. Whoa, that mast got big. All right, and then we've got a jib. Whoa, that jib got big. Needs a little bow sprit. Um, all right, and then on this, the Dragoon also, going back to the Dragoon, it was optional uh, if you had a, a boom or not. So like we were talking about last week, if your mainsail finishes, if the clue of the mainsail, the back bottom corner, is further forwards than the back beam, then it is possible to sail it without a boom because the main sheet is going to be putting some tench, tench, tension into the foot of the sail as well as, well as the leech. Uh, this is a recap. If your boom extends or if the, um, the clue of the sail is further back than the back beam, you absolutely have to have a, um, a what you call it, a boom on there. Otherwise, you'll get this ridiculous shape in the foot of the sail and it will be completely uncontrollable. So um, there's the main sail. All right, so if we consider the two main um, methods that we could capsize on a catamaran, uh, one of them sideways, one of them forwards, I think we don't need to talk about the backwards because when you're capsizing backwards, it's unlikely that you're going to hit anything. You might just hit the rudder system a little bit, but it's more the forwards or the sideways where there are more items on the boat that you could come into contact with. So let's say, firstly, um, this is actually a bit of a recap on the seven ways to capsize video uh, that came out I don't think it was last year. I think it was the year before. But um, yeah, so we went through this kind of stuff in that very good video. I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, but if we're going to do a normal capsize and we're both trapezing, so normal meaning we're going to go over sideways, you may have seen, like if you have seen the video that Willis is talking about that I just put up, it's just a short like 20 second clip of uh, that windy day with Pirate Sam, when it was um, an absolute toe curler. Um, yeah, we were definitely going to capsize sideways. So if you are, in fact, on the sideways capsize, I would say always best to aim towards the back of the sail. Um, if you're the helm or the crew, aim for the back of the sail. And once you know that you're definitely going, um, and you'll know when you're definitely going, when there's just this irresistible pull uh, towards the boat, um, at that point, when you know that you're going, just give it a little boost with your legs just to get a little bit more flight and direct your flight to try to... So with this boat is now on its side, so we're aiming to land 
just off the back of the mainsail here. Um, if we do land on the back of the mainsail, then it's not such a big drama. We are less likely to damage the mainsail if we land at the back. If we land towards the front of the mainsail, uh, two things that could happen there. One is we're getting a bit dangerously close to the mast. Um, because we're close to the mast, the sail is going to feel a lot more solid there, which does mean if you land on your foot in that position, you might experience a bit of twisty ankle or something, which, um, you know, nobody wants that. Um, also, if your sail is a little bit older, um, then you might actually go through the sail at that point, because next to the mast, the sail hasn't got any give. It's just going to be like a solid wall, a solid floor that you're landing on. And if you do land on the mast, then that could, of course, really sting a bit. So aiming for the back of the sail is best because, in theory, if the boat is capsizing sideways, then the helmsman or whoever's controlling the main sheet should have uncleated the main sheet um, and that should be loose. So if you do land at the back edge of the sail, the sail should just go out. Don't you think? If the helm hasn't uncleated the main sheet, then in the um, investigation of what caused the capsize, I know who is going to be fingered there. Yeah, so if it's a sideways capsize, I would certainly go for that position there. If it's a sideways capsize and you happen to be sat on the boat, and um, your boat has got a boom, then what I would do is when you know that you're definitely going, I would kind of start climbing down um, so that you land nicely in the water on the other side. One big um, hazard on the catamaran, if you do capsize sideways, um, all right, let's just have diagram two. Uh, which would be something there's the mast all right so we have got you'd think it wouldn't happen but it does happen occasionally these small objects that I've drawn on here are the toe straps on the trampoline if you do slide down the trampoline without restricting yourself at all, or um, or if you actually slide down your trampoline on your front and you've got your trapeze harness on, you can actually end up going. This is Willis's tip. Use the lighter colours first. Thank you very much. Um, you could actually end up going between the toe strap and the trampoline which is quite a bad position to be in. And then if you've got your trapeze harness on, then it gets more precarious. So if you are going over sideways, just try to climb down. Once you know that you're going, then use everything you've got there to be a bit more graceful going down the boat. So I think that's the sideways covered. Then if, if we're going into a pitch pole, where we are definitely sticking the nose in, then one of the things that is the major contributor to the boat actually capsizing when you stick the nose in is actually the... Um... Oh, you can't even see that. That's, I've gone too far. is this guy still hooked on. And it's actually the weight of the people swinging forwards, which actually pulls the boat over. But then if the bows do stick in and you haven't got any way of staying anchored to the back of the boat, then you're definitely going to go. Um, so if you are sailing in conditions where you feel but there is a lot of a, a big chance of sticking the nose in. Uh, you may have seen the Hawaiian 
capsized writing line system. Now this, if we've, this is a Hobie 16, 14 thing, by the way, apologies to everybody who sails uh, a different boat, but if we've got our raised trampoline, we're just changing boat here, then around the pylons of the trampoline, you have a rope, uh, but a lot of other boats have these as well, like the Dart 18 uh, has one as standard. A lot of F-18s are fitted with what might be called a chicken line, which basically is a line that comes from the back of the boat. So if you're single trapezing, just the crew out on the trapeze, they can grab hold of that line, which means if the bows dig in, um, the um, crew can stay anchored to the back there doesn't go flying around the front and you're much less likely to pull the boat over. You, you might save like 50% of potential pitch poles by staying anchored to the back of the boat. There we are. Yes. Um, but if you are definitely pitch poling and you're both on the trapeze, like I said, with the sideways cap size, best thing you can do to make sure that you're safe is just give it a little boost away from the side of the boat in a kind of abseiling kind of way. Just bend your knees, spring outwards, just so you get a little bit of um, air between your feet and the side of the boat. And then just by being that far away, it means you'll swing clear of everything and you'll just land in the water in front of the boat. Easy. And if you are still attached to the trapeze, that's actually a good thing because it means you will still be attached to the boat. But what I would say in both situations is if you are still hooked onto the trapeze, as soon as you come up from the water, unhook from the trapeze, but hold on to it so that you can then use the trapeze line to pull yourself back to the boat. But um, don't stay hooked onto the trapeze uh, because if the boat does invert, then you might get caught up in that. So definitely unhook from the trapeze, but hold on to it. There you go. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the worst, well, one place that you should definitely try to avoid if you are in a capsizing situation, which would be more for the crew, is in this area here. This is... There's all sorts to get tangled up in there and to hit yourself on. So if you're sat on the boat and you're capsizing, if you go digging the bows in and you're sat on the boat, then just grab hold of something solid further back on the boat than you. So like the toe strap, uh, if you can get the back beam, the side beam, anything at all that's solid that's further back than you, that's what you should be holding on to. If you're going for one of these kind of wild rides where helm and crew are both sat on the boat, he's got very short legs, um, on a downwind, then as well as having the jib sheet in your front hand, I would say it's worth holding on to something, excuse me, holding on to something with your back hand the whole time so that then if the bows do stick in and the boat stops suddenly, then you've got that anchor to stop you from going flying forwards. Because uh, especially if you sat on the boat, there is a lot of stuff to hit. So there we go. I think we're off to a flying start. Thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Uh, great to have you all with us. Um, let's just check in with everybody who's checking in. Um, All right. So. Um, oh, and then in answer to Willis's second part of the question, any more footage of sailing at 25 knots and binning it? I think that I probably have somewhere. Yeah, I just thought I, I was just going through some footage earlier and I thought I reckon a 20 second clip might ignite the uh, imagination of certain sailors. And uh, there we are. All right. Finn says, with the dragoon boom that connects to the end of the sail, 
does it change the performance to a boom along the bottom of the sale? Yes. Um, yeah. So like I was saying there, it just gives you a bit more control of the bottom part of the sale. Without a boom, you're always going to have this amount of, if we, you know, an amount of curve in the bottom part of the sale. And the only real control you've got over that curve is how much tension you're putting in the battens. But they're, of course, going to bend more um, as they get loaded up with more pressure. Whereas when we put... Um, when we put a boom on the sale, so if this is our boom, the boom will be slightly longer. Um, we then got the ability to flatten off this whole bottom panel of the sale, basically up to the up to this batten, maybe a bit beyond, because once we get beyond that, the shape of the battens takes over a bit, really. But there is a significant amount of sail area here. And if we can flatten that off, especially when it gets windy and we're sailing upwind, we can really get more performance out of the boat. We'll be able to point higher. It won't feel so much like the boat's just trying to fly a hull the whole time. And um, yeah, point higher, go faster, boat will feel better if we flatten off the bottom of the sail. So we'll do that using the clue out hall, which will kind of, how would that be? There'd be a rope. So there'd be a, a clue strap that goes around the boom here and then a rope that goes to the end of the boom and perhaps it will go forwards to a cleat. That's a cleat. Um, further forwards along the boom. So you can pull that to flatten the sail off works really well. So, and it is an optional extra on the Dragoon, so well worth using it if you have got the facility. Uh, the big reason why people don't use the boom is because of this fear of hitting your head on the boom. But if you're, um, if you're looking at getting the decent performance out of the boat, having to duck a little bit more when you tack or jibe is a small price to pay for that extra performance and control of having uh, the boom on the boat. There you go. Landing on the boom and it gets a big bruise. Yes, indeed. All right, we've got Fleet 240 Santa Cruz. Oh, it's Laura. Um, hi, Laura. How are you doing? Um, great to have you on board. I have got Laura's got a pre-loaded question coming up in a short bar. I'll just finish with checking in with everyone and then we'll go on to your pre-loaded question there, Laura, I think. Um, we've got Rishi on board. Hi, great to have you on board with us. I believe that's the first time on board for you, as it is for Jerry the Leg. Unbelievable. Yeah, Jerry used to come out to um, Wildwind Sailing Holidays uh, quite a few times. And then I believe he moved to Cyprus, I think. Um, yeah, great to have you with us, Jerry. Um, hope it's all going well for you there. All right, Finn says, how fast is the F-18? The F-18 is pretty fast around the course, that's for sure. There are boats which are fast in a straight line. Um, and then there's boats which are fast around the course. To be fast around the course, of course, you have to be fast in the straight line because you're going to be sailing a series of straight lines to get around the course. But um, yeah, the um, with my experience with the F-18, the top speed I've had has been something around 24 knots. Um, and that would be actually with or without the spinnaker, just with the um, the C2, which is um, a more modern design F18 with more of a flat bottom. Um, that really absolutely cranks with the spinnaker up. It is so quick, feels absolutely amazing. I can only imagine how the Acura 
must feel on those downwind points of sale because the C2 already felt absolutely amazing. And it just goes. You get more wind, it goes faster. More wind goes faster. Um, but it also, you get that top speed on the two sail reach as well. But like the boat, like um, the older F-18, which the example that we have here is the um, Hobie Tiger, that definitely gets its top speed on the two sail reach where put the dagger boards up nice and high, sail it a bit like a Hobie 16 in the Joyrider TV position at the back, work in the main sheet. And uh, yeah, about 24 knots for those boats. Uh, we got Max on board. Hello, Max. Hope for some wind at the weekend. Water, two degrees, but not frozen. Well, that sounds uh, pretty tropical. I think um, not yet time to reach for the shorty wetsuit, but um, uh, I hope you have a great sail and uh, and it's uh, pleasant. All right, we got Scott. Morning, Scott. Uh, great to have you on board as always. Dropping it in the slot with Scott. All right, Toot says, last week's chat, I met Carl, who is on the same lake, just a little to the south. He has 16. He is restoring. Great to meet another sailor on the same lake in a chat from Greece. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That is the joy of, you know, one of the big um, sort of reasons why I do all this is it's just so nice to have that feeling that I'm bringing people together um around the world or even around the lake um who otherwise might not have bumped into each other um so it is really nice that you guys have formed this kind of community and i think something we could look at doing in the future a bit more formally if anybody's got any ideas i'd like to hear them is um to set up some sort of um database of the Joyrider TV community members, where it is that they sail. So if, um, for example, like we had last week, um, I can't remember who it was. Um, it might have even been Scott there. Um, Scott was going, I think it was Scott going to um, the uh, west coast of the USA and he wanted someone to sail with. And he found someone to sail with to get out for a sail. So that sort of thing as part of the Joyrider TV global community. But how we would do that formally while at the same time not opening a door to, you know, people on the Internet are always trying to make um, a bit of cash out of your rob you or something. So um, how we'd go about that. But if anybody's got any ideas how we could do that then that would be great. I know that's kind of what the Facebook groups are for. But um, anyway, just thinking out loud there. All right, Finn says, to get to Vasiliki Bay, where do you fly from with the included flights? Yeah, for people coming from outside of Europe, we wouldn't generally... Um, yeah, just to rewind a little bit, actually, what we normally do uh, with Wildwind is we do these package sailing holidays where we organise the flights, the accommodation, all of the sailing instruction, everything you want. Um, but for people coming from outside of um, Europe or outside of the countries where we do the complete package, we get them to book their own flights and then we just do it as accommodation and the sailing as a package. So just the accommodation and sailing as a package because it's much easier and it gives you a greater flexibility to be able to book your own flights. Um, our local airport is called Preveza, um, which is about an hour away from where we are. Um, it's but it's uh, a small airport. So to fly from Australia, you'd probably have, you definitely have to fly to Athens 
and then either see about getting a connecting flight to Prevesa or what a lot of people would do who were flying into Athens is would be to rent a car from Athens and then drive down from Athens to here. It's about a five-hour drive, but you get to see all of Greece and Greece has got a lot to offer. So um, that would be the way to go about doing that. All right. Willis says, I want you to link your cap size and recover down below. My dad was reluctant to see it, but loved it once he saw it. Nice. Um, yeah, I can't go sniffing around for that just now, but um, perhaps later. Oh, we've got Novacat Catamaran. Yes, this must be Nicholas, I believe, or um, someone from his family. Great to have you on board. Now, Novacat Catamaran is actually going to be featured in a big way in um, this weekend's Show Us Your Cat. Very exciting times. I just finished editing that yesterday. And um, all right, just a quick uh, spoiler alert is um, Nicholas uh, Novacat Catamaran has built his own boat from scratch. And he's very nicely documented the whole procedure. So we're going to be taking a look at that, uh, which is really nice. So, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. All right. Gustavo in Uruguay. Great to have you on board. We're hitting all the corners of the planet right now. This is great. Um, all right. Oh, there's Laura talking about the Mary Poppins. I've rubbed it out now. Yes. Sorry, I'm just reading um, everyone. Oh, we got Chris on board in Texas. Better late than never. Not that late. Morning. Yeah, we've got Mark on board. I assume it's just Mark. Well, maybe Janet's there as well. Howdy. Um, okay. So I'm just going to cease with the live chat there to go on to another question. Uh, to All right. So we've got a question from Laura, who's from Fleet to 40 in Santa Cruz, USA. And she says... Please go over, go over spotting the ley line to Mark A. If this just sounds like absolute nonsense to anyone, what on earth does that mean? All right. So as we know, the wind always comes from the top of the board. So this is the wind. So we're talking about um, we're talking about tacking angles and we're talking about our best route on the upwind leg of a race course. So if this is our mark, the first mark is usually the upwind mark. So we'll have started from down here somewhere. And the first mark is usually called mark A. So um, there we go. There's a bit of a backstory there. So when you're sailing your boat as a rough um, where am I going to put him? All right, let's go over here. So we're out of the way a bit. Generally speaking, if we're sailing the boat fairly efficiently, and it really does vary from class to class, um, when we tack, we end up at about 90 degrees to the angle where we started. So that is our starting point. Um, so this is a general tacking angle of a catamaran or of most boats, to be honest. Um, there are boats that point a lot closer to the wind. Um, so in catamarans, pointing the closest to the wind would probably be something like an A-class, which is extremely efficient. The boats with dagger boards should certainly be pointing the closest to the uh, to the wind. And then the boats with asymmetric hulls will be pointing a bit, a little bit less close to the wind. 
if you're finding when you're sailing generally, before we look at the course, that your angle is bigger than 90 degrees, it might be that you're not actually sailing close enough to the wind. So we've been through this before. So just very quickly, um, the way we know how close to sail to the wind is we pull the jib in tight and the stronger the wind is, the tighter we're going to pull on the jib sheet to flatten the jib off. Um, and then we've got our telltales on the jib, one on the side of the boat that we're sitting and one we can see through the sail. If at any point the telltale on the leeward side of the sail, on the side of the sail that we're looking through, um, if that's not flying straight back, that means we have to bring the boat up towards the wind. That means we're definitely too far away from the wind. But like we talked about last week, we've got this vicious circle that can occur, especially when it's getting windy. If we try to keep both telltales flying straight back, what happens is having them both flying straight back, we sail very fast, which creates more induced wind like that, which means we have to turn more away from the wind to keep it going. So we actually end up just turning um, this way to keep the boat going. So when it's windy, it's very important to have our inside telltale lifting like this or perhaps even higher. Oh, hold on. Did something happen? Am I still here? I looked round and I was frozen. I'm hoping that I'm not frozen. Um, yes. So we have to sail on the upwind with the inside telltale really flying high. And that is how we're going to maintain this angle of roughly about 45 degrees off the wind or a 90 degree tacking angle. So, um, yeah. So how do we know how high to fly that inside telltale? Um, basically, bring let the boat come up towards the wind and there will be a point where you real, really feel the boat slowing down a lot and almost you're stopping. So when you get to that point, you've gone a bit too far. Perhaps by that point, the front part of the jib is going to just start flapping a little bit. So just bring it back a little bit. But um, we're just keeping a very light touch on the rudders because obviously we've all tuned our rudders. So they're all sweet. Um, and we just keep in the boat at approximately this angle. If we get a gust of wind, we can come up a little bit because as the hull lifts, we can take it higher because as well as taking the power off, when the hull lifts, we're getting a bit more traction from the hull, which is in the water, which is allowing us to go higher. The other thing that might stop us from being able to sail close enough is if our boat trim is bad. So if we're either too far forwards or too far back on the boat, we do need to keep the boat balanced so it's generally flat. So if we looked at the boat as a whole thing, the whole thing should be flat. If it's really choppy, and you are risking sticking the nose in occasionally uh, because of the chop, then perhaps trim it back a little bit to avoid that. And then, but generally it should be flat. So then once we've established what our tacking angle is, um, and you'll get used to knowing what your tacking angle is by going out in different conditions, um, getting the boat sailing upwind nicely, and then tacking and then sort of going, all right, so we, yeah, that's about 90 degrees. And it's pretty much, I've always gone for 90 degrees on any type of boat, always 90 degrees. And it's really um, quite a handy, quite handy to have that. Um, so 
how do we judge where the ley line is? So the ley line, what we're talking about here, is it's an imaginary line that's coming off the boy. And we know that basically when we've crossed this line, when we tack, we can get around the boy. In um, normal sailing boat racing, we always leave the marks on the left side of the boat. It's only in match racing where they go around the other way. Um, but generally in normal sailing boat racing, we go around the, the boys, leaving the boy on the left side. Of course, if it's a long distance race, that might be different as well. All right. So how do we judge when to tack? Uh, what we want to do is go beyond 90 degrees. And then when the boy is just beyond 90 degrees, that's the point when, in theory, we should be able to make it around the boy. Um, so there are different methods that people use to determine what is 90 degrees. One is you could just kind of visualize, line up, down your beam, visualize that way. Um, another one that people do for people with normal mobility is um, if you're on the trapeze, if you look over, if, if I'm on the trapeze, we're going this way. So to extension main sheet, if I look over my back shoulder and I can see the boy out of the corner of my eye, that means we've gone far enough. But you do, of course, have to calibrate yourself to get that dialed in, that gauge. Um, but I think judging 90 degrees isn't too bad. If you are not coming first in the race, a really good way of seeing where is the right place to tack is there might be other boats which are already on the other tack. And what you can do is when you sail across, because you wouldn't really want to tack to get someone's dirty wind anyway. But when you sail behind someone, you can just look through their boat as you sail behind them, look at where they're pointing. And if they're pointing to the left of the boy, that means that they've tacked too early. So you should continue. And you can gauge it by looking at the other boats. So this guy has tacked too early. This guy has tacked probably about right. You could say it's a bit late, but uh, depends on the scale here. But um, you, you don't want to be coming in too critical at the mark. If you get it absolutely perfect, it is very nerve wracking as you're coming along that ley line because what we haven't talked about at all is that the wind is rarely completely consistent. So if the wind shifted round just a little bit to the left, that of course means that our whole angle that we're going to sail is going to be different. So we'll be pointing if I can bring him back here a bit, we'll be pointing higher on this tack, but the ley line, if the wind has gone round, that ley line is going to have shifted round as well. So that's going to be kind of... more like there if the wind shifted round like that. So um, we've got to be aware of these wind shifts as well. So 90 degrees is normally the key. Now, there are different ways that we can sail around the course. So if we just, if we go for, from this, if this is our start line, the different ways 
that we can sail around the course. Usually we'll start the race on the starboard tack. So we'll start off on starboard tack. And then, of course, we're going to have a ley line going this way as well. And then you could continue on the starboard tack all the way until you hit this ley line. Tack. And then tack there and go around the buoy. Now, this can work um, more so if you're, if it's not a very big fleet or if you know that the fleet is going to be really well spread out. But if you're in a big fleet of boats which are at a similar speed, this is a really high risk move because if you're coming in here, you're on port tack, which means you have no right of way when you're coming into the boy there. And you might have who knows how many boats coming up on starboard and you might have to sail behind them all and give up a load of space. But if the wind is strong, basically, when we're choosing which way we're going to go around the course in a catamaran or a fast boat, we're generally looking at where is the wind strongest. Um, unless you're sailing in an area with a lot of tide or current, then we want to go where the wind's strongest because we're going to sail faster in that stronger wind, which is going to get us to the first buoy uh, quicker. So this would be called um, hitting the, uh, the port ley line or banging the left corner. The opposite would be if we were to go off this way, We could go this way, tack here. Now that has got some appeal because we're going to be coming in on this starboard ley line on starboard tack. But what we're doing here is with this tack, as well as the strategic uh, points that it might be a bit of a gamble hitting that corner because who knows if the wind's going to hold or um, the other side. It's really a gamble because if it turns out that this side of the course is favoured, you've just thrown the race away by going all in. It's like, we're going all in, lads. Um, but the other thing with coming in all the way on that starboard ley line is the further we get away from the boy, the more difficult it's going to be to judge that time when it is to tack. Um, because as we come along here, if there's any land in the area, like there might be an island up here, or it might be an offshore wind, or there could be anything going on with the land, the wind might shift. And if it shifts either way, it's going to cost us. Because if it shifts so we can actually sail higher up here, so if it goes around this way, it actually means that the boats that are coming in later are going to benefit because they're going to be able to tack earlier, saving them time. We, we could go on, as I'm sure that you could um, uh, imagine. This is a big topic. Sorry for going on for so long on this. But... Um, the kind of, uh, what would we call it, the conservative method and what I would say is a good idea if it's a small to medium sized fleet is go, if you're going off the start line, go up here until when you tack is going to put you between five and ten boat lengths from mark A when you tack the next time. That makes it a lot easier to judge when to tack. It's not going to be as congested with boats coming in at starboard because you're further away from the boy and there should be some more gaps between the boats there. So that, I would say, is a good conservative plan for that rounding. There we go. I hope that helps. I hope, um, I hope that uh, wasn't too much of a mess.
at this point, I'm just going to take a short commercial break for those watching later. Oh, yeah. Getting the weekend started. All right. So who else have we got on board? All right. Willis says, I'm going to put the trampoline on backwards so that I can lash my scuba gear, emergency paddle, anchor, etc. at the front. Do you have any tips for no trap as mellow as possible? Toe straps, one twip, twist or two. I would go for one twist in the toe straps. Yeah, so it's always good um, with your toe straps on your trampoline, if they're ones that aren't stitched on and you do have the option to tie them yourself, then I would generally go for one twist in the toe strap because what that does is it makes it a lot easier to slide your foot under Whereas if they're just flat, they can just lie completely flat on the trampoline, making it much more difficult to get your foot under one twist. All right, we've got Lee on board uh, in Macon, Georgia. Good day, mates. All right, so. Um, Yet yeah, Toot says, wow, reversing the trampoline is a great idea. Wish I'd thought of it. Um, yeah, well, there you go. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much to Laura for um, that donation. Yeah, you can actually give donations in the live chat if you like an answer. If you like the answer, there you go. Uh, thank you very much for that. Okay. So I had to work out what this It's all quite new to me, this, um, this element. All right. So, oh, we've got Mike on board. Um, hi there, Joe. Finally got my 1978 Hobie 16 fully registered. Registered. Thanks for the killer content. Keep it up. Nice one. Yeah, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, great to have you on board. Chris says the old NACRA boats did fine without a boom. Yeah, um, and... Some of the old NACRAs had the little half boom thing where you did have that that um, bit of adjustment where your main sheet could be pulling from. So if you put the little car on the half boom further forwards, it would flatten the bottom of the sail off, put it further back, and it would put more curve into the bottom of the sail, effectively working like an outhaul um, on a conventional boat with a boom but i i would wager those nacra boats that did fine without a boom would they have done even better with a boom there's the question all right so toot says in reversing the tramp any problems i think the biggest problem is you're going to be putting your pockets um at the back the pockets where you'd usually put your halyards um, and other things at the back. But other than that, um, there might... No, I, I can't see any proper difficulties. In fact, um, I do feel like it is something that I should try when I put a 16 together. So uh, there we go. That will be coming soon. Can you put your trampoline in backwards? Yes. Um, it just reminded me, this is Willis again on my 16. It's a 71 16 that Willis has got. He's got, has anybody got an older boat than Willis? Put it in the comments. Um, there's a loop of rope on the tail of both sides. What are these for? Mm. I can't quite visualize what you're saying there. You might have to rephrase that. Right, so um, all right, Mike says my hobie came with some older style trapeze harnesses, 
Do you have any experience with those? Yeah, um, yeah, I've been using trapeze harnesses for a long time. The older style trapeze harnesses, I would guess, are the ones that lace up with just one central strap that comes up between the legs. Some people can't quite handle the um, crushing aspect of these. But for me, um, somehow, uh, it was always fine. But one thing I would, yeah, so I'd say there's nothing wrong with older style trapeze harnesses. Just check the condition of any ropes or webbing. Is it going to break? But the most important thing to have a look at, and this is an upgrade that I'm suggesting to everyone, is, is it possible to replace the hook or the plate that's got the hook on it for one which has got a quick release hook? Because um, there is a possibility to get trapped by a trapeze hook. If you've got a quick release on there, then that can get you out of many sticky situations. So it's well worth having a look at that. But if your trapeze harness is one which has got the hook on a metal plate, which maybe it's got holes in the side where the lacing goes, and then the hook like this um a lot of these older ones also might have a little rubber grommet that sits there the idea with that rubber grommet is so that once you've hooked in it doesn't come unhooked but what became popular with those it was like a precursor to the quick release hooks is people started taking them off because they wanted to be able to unhook a lot more quickly. And it is a very sensible uh, safety option to get rid of a little rubber grommet or if you've got anything else there to stop you from getting unhooked. But other than that, um, great to have a bit of retro styling, I think. We've got E1K, hello, in France. Great stuff. All right, we've got not our gang. Guten Tag. It's good to have you with us. Is there something to say about wings? Whew. There could be. All right. At this point, could I say no further questions, please? Sorry. I Maybe I went on about the upwind leg in the racing for a little bit too long, uh, but I've nearly come up to an hour now. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot to say about wings. Um, they are a good feature. I believe not our scan you are sailing a dart 18 is it i can't remember if that is you um but um yeah all right we've been through this before so i'm just and we are getting towards the end so i'll just go through this quickly um what the wings give you on the boat there's a hull there's another hull There's a wing. So plus points of the wings. It's very comfortable. You can sail the boat from sitting on the wing and it is an extraordinarily comfortable position. It turns your beach catamaran into something that's got a bit more of a yacht kind of feel to it where you're actually sitting nicely or maybe a keel boat kind of feel to it where you're sitting nicely in a good position. It's nice for your back, great for your knees, really very comfortable indeed. And that is if you don't want to trapeze as well. Also, you don't have to trapeze. You'll get the same writing moment or similar just by sitting on the wings without having to trapeze or you'll certainly be able to keep a lot more power on with the wings. There's also another position that you could sit in. Sorry, Willis, I used black first. That was a mistake. Um, where um, you can sit on the trampoline if, it, if the wind's light, using the wing as a backrest. Again, very comfortable indeed. Um, the next great feature, trapezing. 
off the wings. Wow, what a feeling to be out there. You are so far away from the boat when you're trapezing off the wings. It is like nothing else. Very special indeed. Other plus point of the wings is um, great for storage. If you're going for some long distance sailing, uh, you've got loads of storage there. It's higher up, so it will stay drier. And the last one with the wings is because you've got these on both sides, you're almost doubling your square meterage of the trampoline space, which means if you have got a boat with a reasonable amount of volume, like uh, the one that springs to mind is the Hobie 18 Classic, you can take more people because you've got more space. Very nice. Now, the downside of the wings is the weight and the windage. These wings, um, a lot of the time, like the, the original Hobie ones that fit on like an 18 Magnum or um, the Hobie 21 SE, um, they are pretty heavy. I think you're probably adding a good 20 kilos to the boat. And also on the upwind, there's a fair amount of windage that you get on those wings. Um, so there you go. Those are the pros and cons about wings. Thank you very much. All right, Finn says, how many people rock up? There are 10 Hobies. Are there always some spare? You're probably right. We've got Sven on board. Sven's one of the wild wind instructors. He's probably... Um, He's probably tuning in from Norway. Sven is Norwegian and South African. What a blend. Very good sailor. And he's just signed the contract to come back for another season on the Wildwind Beach. So if you're coming out to Wildwind sailing holidays, you could be lucky enough to go for a sail with Sven. He's very quick. And he says it's an amazing road. And if you're not keen on driving from Athens... There's also a direct bus. There we go. Yeah, back to how do you get here? Yeah, the bus from Athens is once once you're on the bus, it is nice. You could just put your tunes on, look out the window, loads to see. Very nice indeed. <coughs> All right, Nova Cat Catamaran says, uh, with the Cunningham, do you know something about this technique? Oh, yes, um, maybe we do. Let's have a look at the Cunningham. So no further questions, please, in the live chat. By all means, chat amongst yourselves, say hello and all that, um, <coughs> as you were. All right, so what we're doing with the Cunningham, the Cunningham is also known as the downhaul, is what we're doing initially is we're putting shape into the sail. If we look, we just, we'll just look quite generally so if we look from above, so we're looking down the sail, if we've got no Cunningham on at all, the sail is not, and let's just put the mast just for a reference point there. The sail is not going to have much shape at all. So without the, when the Cunningham is completely off, um, completely loose, it's kind of like having the mainsail switched off. So what I would, one way that I use the downhaul or don't use the downhaul is if it's windy, before I'm actually ready to start powering the boat up, I'll keep the downhaul completely off so that the sail will have no shape to it, which means it's not going to flog or flap violently and the boat won't go very fast. So the mainsail will be as kind of switched off as possible, even in a strong wind. And this is even more useful when you're coming back in, if it's windy, before you get to your destination, let the downhaul off completely. So then you know that when you stop your boat by turning it into the wind, the mainsail is going to be pretty, can I say flaccid? Um, it's not going to do much. It's not going to have much shape to it. So that is the downhaul off. 
then we're ready to start sailing. And picture number two, there's the mast. When we, when we want to get a bit of power into the sail and we want to start going, there is a minimum amount of downhaul or Cunningham that you would put on to get some shape into the sail. And when we get there, we're going to get the maximum amount of curve in the sail. Now, how do we know where this minimum point is? We know where it is because what we do is we pull the Cunningham on with a bit of main sheet pulled on as well, because the main sheet is going to pull down uh, the leech of the sail. It just gives us a more accurate idea of where it is. Pull the downhaul on and you'll see the shape go into the sail quite quickly. And then what we want to do is pull the downhaul so we're getting rid of most of the horizontal creases on the sail. There's our sail, there's our mast. So with no downhaul on, we'll have a load of creases like this and the sail will be a mess. As we pull the downhaul on, these creases will come off out. So we're just trying to get rid of most of those creases when we're pulling the downhaul on to get the max, that is to get the maximum amount of power out of the mainsail. Then as the wind increases, the downhaul can then be used as a progressive control. So this is the minimum. And what I would suggest is once you've found what the minimum setting is on uh, the mast of your Nova Cat 17, is um, put a mark or better still get a calibration sticker with some marks. Unfortunately, I'm not supplying them at the moment, but I am looking for a new supplier of stickers. Um, once I've got it, I'll let you know. But or just put a mark with some tape on the mast because your minimum setting is going to stay in the same position um, until the sail stretches a bit. So for at least once a month, you might need to just check it, but it is still the same. And then when you pull on more than that, you're going to start flattening the sail. The flatness is going to start at the top. So this part of the sail is going to get flatter. You're going to move the center of effort down and forwards. The center of effort is the part of the sail which has got the most shape. So this is really good to do when it's windy is moving that shape down because it's going to stop the boat from wanting to fly the hull as much. We're going to be converting that energy into more boat speed. So we're going to be going faster. The boat's going to be more stable, easier to control by pulling on the downhaul more. So then we'll get to a point where we're going to have the downhaul pulled on maximum and the sail is as flat as it can get. So how much is maximum? Well, what I have said in the past is pull it as hard as you can and then pull it a bit more to get it maximum. And then we're looking for that sail to be really flat. But what? But the shape that we do have in the sail when we've got a lot of Cunningham or downhaul on is gonna to be towards the front. And then the back part of the sail is gonna be very flat. So that front part means that the drive is gonna be coming from there, which is gonna be very efficient. So that is a quick whistle stop tour of what to do with the downhaul. If you've been sailing in strong wind and the wind goes light, it should make sense uh, to release the downhaul a bit, to put more power into the sail, to get through an area of lighter wind. If we're sailing in lighter wind, the wind gets strong, it's more efficient to pull on more Cunningham rather than to loosen the main sheet if you can get your teamwork organized to be able to do that. There we go. All right, we've got Mo on board. Nice to see you, Mo. Okay, Gustavo says, I follow you on YouTube and Instagram because I'm a Nautic sporter lover. Nice. Yeah, great to have you with us. 
All right. Mo says wave and currents are important as well uh, of because you, they might push you off the mark. So we're back onto this race course kind of thing. Uh, I have got one other preloaded question, which I'm going to finish off with today, which is from Matthew, um, by the way, in case Matthew's watching this or watching it later. Um, Willis says maybe for another episode, but I'm still having trouble getting the springs into the rudders under the cams. Any tricks? Definitely one for another episode. One of the jobs that I've got on at the moment is actually, in fact, we could talk about that in next week's Q&A if you want. Um, we'll have a look at that. Copy and paste. Let's just pop that in here. Um, yeah, uh, one of the projects I've got on at the moment is I've totally stripped all of the rudder systems of all of the catamarans from the Wildwind fleet. That's about 60 rudder stocks. And I'm totally refurbishing all of those rudder stocks. Uh, it's what I like to do on those long winter nights. He says, uh, Willis continues, somebody gift you a VHF sat GPS waterproof device so you can review it. Fish finder would be a great addition. Yes, I will take any anything that anybody wants to give me to review. If it is relevant to what we're doing here, then I'm up for it. All right, we got Declan on board. Hello. Any tips for online stores to buy trapeze harnesses? Um yeah yeah are there yeah if you're in the states definitely check out murray's that would be my first port of call if you're in europe i would check out forward sailing perhaps i would if you're in holland i would go to i think it's called catparts.nl um which is the place that used to be hobie cat holland um if you're there's there's a lot of lot of places. Any boat chandlery sort of place would be a good place to look for a trapeze harness. If you let me know what country you're in, maybe we can. Oh, here we go. Declan is in Stockholm. Oh yeah, speak to um, Pia at Hobie Cat Sweden. I'm sure that she'll be able to put you on to a very nice trapeze harness. Yeah, so check out Hobie Cat Sweden if you're in Sweden. It's a great place to start. All right, we've got Mark on board in Sacramento, California. That's a very famous place for the music. Love it. All right, we've got Pano. Yes, Pano. I should send you one Mamos for each Q&A. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right, we've got German Gonzalez. Cheers from Abu Dhabi. All right. All right, we've got Edinson in Colombia. Wow, we are really hitting the whole world here. I'm just going through the uh, live chat in case anybody's wondering. Um, Mark says, I just picked up a 1978 Hobie 16. The previous owner spray painted over the decent gel coat. Recommendations for stripping paint from the gel coat. I'm sorry, Mark, but unfortunately, that is outside my remit of experience of what the best thing to do there would be. Um, I'm sure that there's some people who do exactly that sort of stuff on YouTube. Uh, that is what I would do in that situation, but definitely worth doing, I would say. Um. Willis says, have you already mentioned good helmets? I feel like you did, but I don't know which episode. No, I haven't done any helmet review. I do use a helmet, of course. Um, which is uh, the, one that, the one that I use is the Mystic. Um, I can't even remember what the model of helmet is called. And this is just a really straightforward, it's not particularly heavy. 
Uh, it's got good padding. It's comfortable. Keeps the sun off the head. I've attached all sorts of things to it to put cameras on. Um, but that is a good helmet. But there are many, many options out there. Um, if anybody wants to send me some helmets to test, um, I am keen to do some testing. I think it would really help. And it would perhaps even bring the fact that helmets and, you know, helmets are not uncool. Uh, I'll tell you what's uncool. Concussion. That is not cool at all. So put a helmet on if you're going out and you think that you're going to stack it in an impressive way. Oh, there's Matthew. Greetings from Baltimore. It is Matthew who has got the last preloaded question coming. So I'm just going to finish off with that one, Matthew, by the way, if you weren't here. Chris says, I'm getting into helmets and I'm going to be reviewing both a Whipper Junior and an X over by forward WIP. Nice. We've got Robin on board in Florida. Hi, Robin. All right, Deck Clan says the Hobie 16 was introduced in 1971. Mega. I'm not going to read out everything now. We've been going quite a long time. There's a lot of chat today. Thanks for coming, by the way, and thanks for all the chat. It does make it all, uh, makes it seem very sociable here. All right, Novacat Catamaran says, there are also so-called ball trapeze plates out of carbon. This reduces the possibilities of damage to things or getting trapped in the hook. Yeah, we had some of these um, for testing a long time ago, like 20 years ago, but um, they never became popular. The ones that we had were called the Bethwaite system, where your trapeze harness would actually have like a spreader bar like this. But instead of having a hook, it had like a key shaped hole like that and then instead of having a trapeze ring this was actually a there was a more stiff part on the end of the trapeze with a ball and then the ball actually i've put this upside down sorry this is upside down i could just see that now it's not going to work um and then the ball you just put through the hole that slides into the top bit because it's upside down. And then there you are, no holes for your boat from the trapeze hook. And you're not going to catch that on anything. Yeah, good point there. Back to the wings, Toot Bungie's paddles under his wings. All right, so Not Our Gang has given his measurements to Vic in Canada. Vic, who we, of course, saw and show us your cat with the wings that he's making himself. So, yeah, if you're getting Vic to make you some wings, once you've got those wings, we want to see those wings. All right. All right, we've got Damien on board. Hello, and hello, fellow sailors. All right, Not Our Gang says, Guten Tag. We here in Austria say... Serve us. Okay. All right. We've got Sven on board. Huh. What is the a good name for an F-18? Wow. Is this, would this be like if you were um, designing a boat? Yeah, I would. Uh, <coughs> I'll have to come back to you on that one. Let's we'll we'll put out a competition uh, like good old design did, and the Acura was the winner. Um, I think you don't want to go for a snake. I think you want to go for something that no one else has gone for with the name of an F eighteen, um, like um, some sort of uh, a sea otter of some description. All right, all right. Toot says to Sven. A good name for an F-18 is finally legal. Nice one there, Toot. All right. I think everybody else is getting involved in this boat naming um, shenanigans. We've got Ryan there from Maui. Says fire it up. 
that's a good name. Fire it up. Yeah. Um, pick your favorite ACDC song and uh, slap that on the side of your F-18. I think that that could work. All right. Declan is coming in with some um, tips for how to get rid of that paint that uh, Mark had over the top of his gel coat. I'm going to read this out. This is good information. It says start with acetone, rub with a cloth over the paint, do small areas. The paint will soften and then use fine sandpaper to rub off the heavy bits. Most will come away with a few applications. Thanks very much for that, Declan. That's very useful. I think um, there's a lot of people who can benefit from that. All right. <laughs> Toot says uh, back for the F-18 naming. 18 and don't know what I want. There we go. By Alice Cooper. Yeah, I think uh, rock song names are a good source of boat names. All right. Willis says everybody remember to lightly tap the thumbs up button before you leave. Don't smash your computer. Just take a few deep breaths. Uh, exhale slowly and click. Thank you very much for that, Willis. Uh, Mark says, thanks, Declan. I tried citru strip on a small section, but it seemed to soften the gel coat. Ah. All right. Uh, Lee says, uh, good winds in your sails. Or thanks. Uh, see you next time. All right. Right. Matthew was actually listening while he's uh, putting the cover on his boat. Wow, there's a lot of chat today. All right. Right. Next tip from Declan uh, with the removal of the paint he says, I suggest stick to fine sandpaper and a lot of elbow grease. To the non-English speakers, that is elbow grease means effort. You're just doing this a lot. If your gel coat is softening, should check for voids in the gel coat. Might have to fix that first. Chris says, I recently bought my youngest son a harness from Coast Water Sports in England. They shipped it to the States for 20 bucks. Only place that had a junior harness. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think it's one thing that England does have um, is a lot of boat chandleries, places that sell equipment for sailing boats. Um, so if you do get stuck, check out the UK. Although there is a little bit of a niggle with shipping stuff from the UK to Europe, especially. All right, so just continuing. The only name for an F-18 is Hornet. Nice. Um, Mark is planning a trip out to Greece this year or next. All right, Not Ouse Gang is definitely going to send us a wing film. All right, Sven says it's a Cirrus R. Now, Cirrus is not a brand that we have been looking at very much on Joyrider TV, basically because I haven't been able to actually get one in front of me. But if there was an F-18 that I could have a go on, it would be the new Cirrus, because this looks like nothing anybody has ever seen before. Um, yeah, nice choice there, Sven. Lovely. We'd like to see that in Show Us Your Cat. Once it's got a name on the side, there you go. Ah, we've got Russell on board. He hasn't been here for a while. Good to see you. It's finally warming up. Back in the US, ready to get back on the lake. Willis says, rock and roll banana as a boat name. What's new in the Joyrider TV store? Yeah, not, not a great deal, to be honest, in the last couple of weeks. The woolly hat is definitely um, my top item at the moment. But um, yeah, do head over to Joyrider, uh, totaljoyrider.com for all of your... Um, shopping needs if you want me to do a custom t-shirt for you with your with your boat name on it Sven um rock and roll I don't you know I'd have to say not rock and roll banana don't go with that one that would be a crime um 
All right, we've got John on board in Springfield, Missouri. And he's also Mark from Sacramento's brother. Wow, it is a small world on Joyrider TV today. All right, Not Ouse Gang says, I have removed my old colour with razor blades scratching at 90 degrees over the hull. Yeah, we do quite a lot of that um, here when trying to get stuff off the hull that doesn't want to be on the hull. Uh, never actually tried it with paint before, but actually when I was doing the mast on the Tornado, uh, where I was having to take off a lot of um, varnish or epoxy or whatever, I was using a Stanley knife blade, 90 degrees there. All right, I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty soon, I'm afraid. So um, Damien says, I did change my mast base yesterday. Oh, that's Damien with the getaway. All good. Just lost half a drill bit inside. Do you think that would be much of a problem? No, I don't think so. And I wouldn't worry too much about the rust. I don't think. Um, I think it should be okay. Right, Mark has got a Hobie 16 orange crush and he's called it crushing it. Nice. Yeah. Right, Matthew's Hobie 14 turbos named Catapult. Ob quite obvious inspiration for that name. Funky Koo Medina. It's a good name. Yeah, definitely into that. All right. So Damien's mask base took quite a hammering to get out and quite a hammering to get the new one in. Well, it's not going to come out again, then, is it? All right. Declan says former 18 name, Double Trouble, USA F, F18 Hornet might require you to add an afterburner there we go yeah um what a friend of mine has told me actually with a lot of the names of catamarans uh the types of catamarans is there is an, a, a huge amount of catamarans that share the same names with airplanes uh with jets so uh that's quite interesting all right ryan says when i order my new hull ports from Murray's. Going to use the Joyrider promo. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, the last preloaded question, which is from Matthew. Who's there? He has got a Hobie 14 turbo, as we've just heard. Um, and he's trying to get his helming on the trapeze sorted out on there. But he is finding it incredibly difficult slash impossible to move in or out on the trapeze because of the main sheet. He says, my main sheet requires a lot of grip, arm strength to maintain power when it's uncleated. And whenever I move out on the trapeze, I'm pretty much completely out of control the entire time because I lose the grip on the main sheet. The only time when I'm actually able to get out on the trapeze is when I've got the main sheet cleated. But then, of course, you're lacking that ability to unsheet there should you need to. My arms consistently, constantly sore during sailing from holding the main sheet uncleated. Ah, and here is the, I'm not going to call it a punchline, but the, the finish is that the main sheet that Matthew has got is a three to one. All right. I think this is a very easy one to solve, Matthew. The main sheet you've got on your boat is not up to the task. You need to have a six to one, definitely. If um, And the best six to one you can get for the catamaran of this type is <clears throat> the Harken bottom block with a switchable ratchet. That is the best bottom block that you can get for a six to one system for the sort of boats that we're talking about. Um, what I would do if I was looking to upgrade my main sheet and what I have done in the past, actually, is I've just kept looking on eBay, which is um, probably the best source that we have in the UK. 
Also, what people keep reminding me is Facebook Marketplace, uh, Craigslist, anywhere else where you can find used boat parts. You don't need a new one. And it doesn't necessarily need to be for the, you don't have to put um, Hobie 14 in on the search. Just put Catamaran Main Sheet or Hobie Main Sheet. That would be another good search and see what comes up. And you want to get yourself a six to one main sheet system with ideally a switchable ratchet. But in, if not, a pressure ratchet is fine. There we go. And that will solve all of your problems, I'm sure. A three to one main sheet is not going to is not going to be doing the job, especially if you're trying to get out on the trapeze there. So there you go. Sorry to keep you waiting till the end for that quite short answer, but um, that's all we need. All right. So we got Roberto, F a team name suggestion, Serendipity team. Nice. I had to uh, work that one out. Yeah, there's Ryan. He says six to one. Oh, the rope. Oh, that's a good good point there from Ryan in Maui. He also says that the rope diameter is a it can be an overlooked um element of getting your uh of making it easier. You want to be looking at I'd say eight mil or nine mil um rope for your main sheet. And, um, you know, if you can afford to, it's nice to get something nice for your main sheet. Um, what I'm using is uh, either eight or nine mil Maffioli Swift cord, which is a very nice rope, very soft. And we've been using it on our 16s for a long time. I think the stuff that we've got on the 16s is probably about eight years old, which in real boat sort of years that is a lifetime so that maffioli swift cord rope will last forever for a normal boat not forever maybe you'll have to replace it once so even if it costs you like a hundred usd uh it's worth every penny because it lasts lasts a long time and it feels great it's not too heavy there we go gustavo says gloves as well yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. And two has tooted in with uh, gill gloves suck. I'm sure not all gill gloves suck, but um, perhaps just the ones that you've got. I'm sure they've got probably a range. All right. Matthew says, I think I'll use eight mil pre-stretched polyester for my main sheet. Nice. From West Marine. OK, that'll work. And Mark says... To Ryan, he's going to Maui first two weeks in April. Recommendations on where to rent a Hobie 16. There we go. I can feel something coming here. All right. So there we go. Thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in. This has actually been the longest Q&A I think that we've done. So sorry, but it was a bit of a rambling mess. A lot of reading for me tonight. Um, but I um, hope you all have an absolutely great weekend. Um, and... Sunday, show us your cat. We're going to be taking a look at something special. So make sure you don't miss that one. So I might see you at show us your cat for a bit of your old live chat there. Or otherwise, I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thanks very much for coming. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Lovely job.